this is the perfect RIA In case you didn't know Bringing you all the strategies To help your business grow Are you happy? Are you satisfied? Are you hanging on the edge of your seat? Sit back and listen in While you feel the beat, yeah! What exactly is a value add? Welcome back to another amazing episode of the Perfect RA Podcast. I'm your co-host and co-founder, Micah Shalansky, and with me, as usual, the legendary Matthew Jarvis. How's it going, bud? Micah, man, it's so great to be back to recording podcasts. Uh, for those of you that are long-time listeners, you know that Micah and I both just came out of Surge. And so uh, what you've been listening to in the past couple of weeks are episodes we recorded before Surge. Now you're listening right. to post-Surge. And so it's fun to get back into this weekly routine, right? We do these every Monday morning. Uh, and while it's amazing to deliver massive value to the industry, it's just really a lot of fun for you and I to be able to get on this and, and dive deep into our practice and really analyze and say, hey, what am I doing and why am I doing it and how can I do it better? You know, it really is. It gives us a focal point, right? So we always talk about things that are happening in our practice and it's just real life information, you know, good and bad. And that's one of the things I love about doing that little blog uh, while I'm going through surge, what works and what doesn't work. And it's real life stuff. But this is the thing that I've learned the most working with other advisors on is how to improve my practice is just the day to day stuff, right? It's not like we have some new way to do financial. Pl- well, actually, we, we do have a better way to do financial planning, but that's a different story, uh, yeah. you know, but it's not like, oh, we're reinventing math. It's the same math that everything goes down, but there can be a better way to deliver that to client. And it's all about creating those sticky changes with clients. And I talk about clients of this all time, Jarvis, and I'm sure you do as well. I don't want to make the change for the sake of making a change. I want to make a change that one goes towards their goals. But number two is a sticky change. That means it's going to stick. It's going to do it right. I'm not looking for New Year's resolutions that we start for a week and then we get off on a bender. And then all of a sudden we, we fall off the track and we're never going to pick it up again. I want to make incremental changes to my clients' lives that are sticky, that are going to help them achieve their goals. And that's kind of this new way of doing financial planning with value adds, which I just think is freaking amazing. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And of course, Micah, you and I have been doing value adds in our practices for many years before we even met each other. It's one of the eerie things that we were both doing yeah. uh, simultaneously. In fact, we, we meet several rock star advisors who are also doing a similar thing. But what we've discovered, though, is that value adds have now become this catchphrase in our industry, like comprehensive financial planning, and, and all the meaning has been sucked out of it, right? So everyone is now saying, hey, you need to deliver massive value or deliver deep value or my new favorite, Someone you need to have that. value drips. That's, uh, that's my new favorite value, drips. Sounds like a disease. Anyway, it's, it's taking the meaning out of it. And so uh, so what, what exactly does that mean? So, Michael, let's dive into in this episode. What does it mean to have a value added? And for me, I always come back to, is this going to give the client specific, actionable advice? That's always what I'm solving for, whether it's a one-page financial plan or our meeting agendas. Does it help the client take specific, actionable advice? You know, a philosophical note, or maybe it is, maybe it's not, but it's interesting that our society has this necessity right now to change the definition of words, right? Mm. Whether it's uh, wh- whatever terminology you want, it says, okay, well, I'm going to take that, but I want to give it my own term because then I can identify better with that. Um, I don't know. That's, that's freaking playing office, right? Just do yeah. the damn thing that works. Um, anyways, that, that's a side note. Uh, another little yeah. side note, which I thought was interesting that I think advisors should be ready for, because this came up in one of my last surge meetings. It was great. A uh, great call with a couple of ladies. Uh, I was just chit-chatting with them, going through things. And one of the things that she said, is, is we're doing our little chit chat. She's like, oh, Mike, I've been meaning to ask you. And this is my client talking to me, by the way. I've been meaning to ask you, how is Surge going for you? And I was like, Surge is actually going pretty well. Thanks for asking. You know what? I kind of talk a little bit about it and says, I really enjoy Surge and this is how it helps my clients and this is the benefits of it and this is all of these other great things, et cetera. But she followed me on LinkedIn and there's a comments that I was made, et cetera. And so she starts hearing this, this uh, industry lingo and kind of uses it back. Now, why is this important to the advisors listening? Because when, not if, when a client asks you this, whether it's what are you doing for value ads, what are you doing for Surge meetings or whatnot, you got to have an answer as to why why you do them or why you don't. Maybe there's a good reason. I haven't heard it yet, but maybe you have a great reason for why you shouldn't be doing value adds. Okay, fantastic. You still got to know what they are because when you get asked about this as a client, what are you going to say? Yeah, um, Mike, not to, to pick up on your rhetorical question, right? Reasons to not do value adds. There, there are a lot of work 
right? Like even in our offices sure. where we've had systems in place for them, we have technology, we've we built custom built technology to do this. We have all this money we've invested in this. It's still a lot of work. It requires a lot of quality control. Um, you need to be ready for clients to respond to that, right? You send out a beneficiary value ad, helping them understand their beneficiaries. There are going to be clients that have questions about that. They're going to call, yep. they're going to email. You need to have a system in place for, for tackling that. So I, I wouldn't, as, as strong as an advocate as I am for value ads, and I'm infinitely strong behind that. Uh, it's not something to just jump into the deep end and think, well, well, Matt and Mike could do it. Surely it must be easy. Yeah, well, I, I would say I'm going to push back on you, Jarvis. Yeah, please, don't take please. it from the aspect of, of saying it's going to be super easy, but you have to do them because it you adds massive them. value to clients. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means. We're going to talk a little bit about how to deliver these and things. But Jarvis, I really want to pull out that one thing you had. You got to create a system for this, and the system has to be with your team. Your team has to know when they get a call from a client asking for like a long-term care one. We did a long-term care one this past summer, and we still get calls on it from uh, from clients. And so our team has had to be prepared. One of the ways we prep our team for is the team has to do the value adds on themselves first, the entire process. So if we're mailing these things out, they got to mail them to themselves. What does it show up in? Now, one thing, Jarvis, I haven't told you this, we just did is for our value adds, if we're going to mail anything to a client, actually value add our paperwork, we have these uh, bright blue envelopes. We just ordered a crap ton of them. And now all correspondence from our office is going to come from this bright blue envelope. So then that way, when clients see it, they know it's something from from our office. Uh, so it's going to oh, stick sure. out in the mail. Is it going to work? Is it not work? I don't know. I'll tell you later, but it's something we're trying. Boy, that's really great. Uh, and so these value ads are just this critical way. They're, they're a great way to demonstrate to clients, right? Dishwasher rule, demonstrate for clients things that you're doing for them, right? We talk about, hey, if you ever look at a client's account, let's say for a Roth conversion and you decide, hey, we do not need to do a Roth conversion. I would love to hear that scenario, but let's go ahead and go with that. Uh, you need to let the client know, hey, we reviewed your situation and we don't need to do a Roth conversion. Now with value adds, and let's use beneficiary review again, you need to find ways, systems, Micah, to your point, to do this at scale. If you're going to sit down by yourself as the advisor and one at a time pull up every client account and write them down and write down the beneficiaries and do the math on how much dollar and type up the form, that will never scale. And I guess if you have yeah. 12 clients, even then you shouldn't do it because you'll never get to 15 clients if that's the way you're doing it. You know, and that's one of the really big things that we, we created these value ads. And then we each had our own little journey with them what, of saying, hey, if all of a sudden I, we start growing our practice, right? We have oh, well, 550 households, maybe close to 600 now uh, as clients uh, firm wide. And so now, great. How do I update these? How do I send this out? How do I know where a client is in their financial plan? And that was just a real pain point we ran into in our office about where is X client in their financial plan? And it's like we had to rediscover it for every single meeting and not every client was on the same path and all of these other things. And it was like, all right, as we're growing to this point, we had to find a way to make sure we were doing the planning we said we were doing. For us, that was value adds. It was, hey, great news. You have the first year you're gonna be onboarded as a client. We're gonna go through all these five areas of financial planning, which is fantastic. Then you're going to fall into our normal routine of reviewing all of these five areas over the next two years, because that's what we do with every single client. And clients friggin' love it. They love the fact that we go through this and say, this is the really important part. It's a discussion piece for us. And you know what? Nine times out of 10, we're going to send you a value add and you're going to look at it and be like, huh, perfect. Everything's great. Fantastic. But that one out of 10 times that you get this and it was like, Ooh, I need to update my beneficiaries. Ooh, I need to update my estate planning. Ooh, I'm in excess distribution. I need to fix something going on in the future. Okay. Now this is a great conversation piece. And that value add was worth 10 X the cost you paid. Oh, for sure. Uh, you know, a quick example of that would be uh, required distributions, right? So we're, we're recording this in early November or mid-November. So my team right now, and we're doing it through a combination of some great technology we have, uh, some things that, Mike, you've built out in Infinity, and some things that we just do as a manual double check. So we've got a list of every single client, not just the clients over age 70 and a half, every single client. Cool. Do they have an RMD? Maybe they inherited an account. Yes or no? Great. Has it been taken? Great. Is the client, have we notified the client that it's complete for this year? Even if there's even if it's on automatic, we still need to notify them. So we're working yep. down this spreadsheet. What the risk is that advisors run into all the time is they try to keep that in their memory. <sighs> did we talk to everybody about RMDs? I think we did. Yeah. Oh, wait, we forgot about Dave and Sue. We forgot to tell Dave and Sue that they don't have an RMD this year because they, they fully converted their IRA to a Roth. So these things cannot be trapped in your mind. 
Now, you know, one of the things, Jarvis, you just said, and I don't think it was a slip up, by the way. Uh, I think it was just something that we actually do in our practice. You said every client over 70 and a half. Now, Jarvis knows RMD age is 72. Why did he say 70 and a half? Because clients still think it's 70 and a half, right? So these are things that we constantly need to bring up to clients. And you as an advisor already know this. Some clients are going to be like, yeah, this was updated in the Secure Act. And we now know it's 72. Some clients think it's 75. Some clients think it's 70, right? It's all those different ages. So the biggest part is you got to be in value adds, in my opinion. Opinion, we got to be ahead of these things. So RMDs are conversations we start talking about early with clients, you know, at 65, 67, yep. at the very yep. minimum, we're talking about dollar amounts of what these RMDs are. Even when clients are coming to us at 55, we're talking about RMD planning because I want to do massive Roth conversions. So these are things we're always planting the seed for. And then Jarvis, I love the fact that you say, great, every single client, where, what are your accounts? Have you taken the RMDs or not? I mean, was it a QCD, right? Do we do the qualified yep. charitable distribution? It's okay. Great. They got a twenty thousand dollar RMD. We put five grand in the QCD. What is your system? What is your process of your team for following up to make sure that money was spent? I'll tell you what ours is. We tell the clients the money must be spent by the first week in December. So it must leave their account, not checks written from their account. It must the checks must be clear out of that QCD account. If not, we're going to say that that probably didn't go through, and we're going to start processing the rest of your RMD. Why do we do that? Well, clients already know some. Sometimes, especially at the end of the year, charities don't cash checks until the next year. It doesn't affect them one way or another. They have no tax liability on one side of it. They get busy, et cetera. But the problem is that has an effect on the client. If the check doesn't clear until January 3rd, but you wrote it on December 20th, does it count as an RMD distribution for a QCD or not? I don't know, but it's not a question I want to have with the IRS. They got to clear the account. And so that is massive value we can add to clients by explaining them what this process is. Now, there's this temptation, and I know we're drilling in on, on RMDs. There's this temptation as a listener to say, this is 101 stuff. Of course, this is the bas- most basic of stuff, but it's not. But when I meet with prospects, and when I meet with prospects who have clients who are with advisors already, and I say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, hey, I'm sure your advisor talked to you about sending some of your required distribution to charity. And they say, no, Matthew, they never talked about that. Even if they had talked to him about it last week, it didn't stick. This is how your clients become my clients, because I just say, hey, listen, I'm sure your advisor's talking to you about this and they say no my advisors never talked oh okay well that's something we do for our clients so whether you say hey i want to do value adds because i want to up my game right i want to be a premium advisor i think that's the ideal motivation but if that's not your motivation then it needs to be the rest of the industry is going to be doing value adds and your clients are going to become the clients of advisors who are doing value adds yeah. So, all right. So, Jarvis, let's talk a little bit about these, right? Because value adds can mean a whole lot of different things. Yes. In the context, I think, is what we're chatting out right now. It's systematized value adds is mainly our discussion. Now, sometimes there's one-off value adds. Here's an easy example of one-off value adds is the uh, IRMA uh, appeal letter, right? Uh, you have an IRMA appeal letter. If your IRMA's over, if your income's over a certain limit, your Medicare premium goes up. There's some qualifying life events that can happen that you can appeal that and go down. I don't have a system wide process that we send that out to every single client, right? Because all I'm going to do is piss off the clients that are in that excess IRMA bracket that don't have a qualified appeal, right? And so those are one-off value adds, which are solid. Those are things we're looking for in planning meetings. Those are things we're helping with the team. Those are things we're looking at in reports to say, hey, how can we glean and pull out this information? In fact, that's what our tax planning software does. Our tax planning software actually grabs and pulls in IRMA brackets and future IRMA brackets, by the way, to say, hey, are we going to bump up this in the next 10 years, something to look at. Those are individualized. But we're talking about is systematized value adds, which these are ones we're going to roll out to all of our clients. Oh, completely, completely. Uh, they're, sorry, I'm just going down so many paths of value adds that go astray, right? Send You send a Roth conversion analysis to a client that doesn't have an IRA. Oops, that, nice. that doesn't work. And so, yeah, value adds need to be specific. Now, Micah, to your point, so the IRMA would be on one extreme, right? That's only going to apply to a handful of clients. But on the opposite extreme, you might say, well, hey, I don't want to do a Roth conversion letter because not all my clients need it. I think on average, I'd be curious your thoughts, okay. Micah. Our value adds are really applying to like 80 to 90% of our clients. Every value add, with a few exceptions, like beneficiaries goes to everybody, but a 1099 letter goes right. to everybody. But there are several that we say, well, that's really not applicable to these handful of clients. And so we'll pull those and either manually do an alternative, which is time consuming, or just say, hey, this quarter, that client's not going to get a value add. So don't get too hung up that you've got to find the value add that fits for 100% of your clients. 
So let's just take a real life example. We did our long term care value ad this this last year, right? As you mentioned, yeah. and you know, there's several clients that this really doesn't apply for, in, in their opinion, they're single, right? Maybe they're a widow. They have money. It says, why are we talking about long term care insurance? Or maybe they already have long term care insurance. It's you know, sure. several clients are like, why are we talking about this? And so we really had to freeze it uh, in advance of, of sending out these value ads, uh, saying, hey. These are conversation pieces. These are things that we want to make sure we're reviewing. And we've already made decisions about these, right? In our planning process, we've already made decisions. You're going to have long-term care insurance. Or are you not? Okay, you got a long-term care plan, but what does that mean? This is now a conversation piece at our next meeting for them to look at, to review, and to say, hey, does our current plan still make sense? So yes. those are things that we still want to send out to our clients. So very few I would pull from. And if you got to start pulling the value ads, and Jarvis, I agree, some, some don't make any sense. Some it makes sense to pull from, um, you know, if a client just passed away, I'm not going to send them, uh, the, their wife, their, their widow, a value add right then. Well, at least not that value add, right. We can have that yeah. conversation at a different time. So you got to make some judgment, but if you start pulling a lot of these and not sending them out to the mass of your clients, mm, maybe to re reevaluate that value add, maybe you didn't set it up the correct way. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, on the, this comment of systems, what we could do a hundred ep uh, episodes on this, we need to look for ways. What are things I can delegate to my team, right? So let's talk about Roth conversions again. Um, you could, as the advisor, pull up each tax return manually, review it manually, do the calculation manually. That, that is an option. Um, you'll never get through them all, at least not any kind of reasonable period of time. Another option, this is something that we often do, is we'll say, great, we'll have a para planner, either internally or externally, go through and we'll say, hey, in a spreadsheet, I want you to put these seven lines off the tax return, the lines of the tax return yep. I need, so that I can now scroll down a list of all my clients, see all of those numbers, Numbers, start looking for anomalies, and then have the Excel, or in our case, Mike, have the software, run um, some calculations on that. So we're always looking for what are steps that I, as the advisor, can pull out of the process and hand to somebody else. Yeah, and this is where checklists come in. I mean, this is why Retirement Tax yes. Services has the 37-point checklist on how to review a tax return, right? Now, great news, you can customize that. That's just a template to get started with. And so yeah. now we can hand that off to a lot of our team members, and they can look at a tax return, and they can say, hey, does everything pass muster, or is something different that now needs to be elevated or highlighted and brought to the advisor's attention? So definitely educating your team on this to, to bring them up with you is a very good point. And Jarvis, I love your idea of that. Of that software again we built it all inside of infinity our, our custom crm uh but if you don't have that great then do excel then do a running sheet in excel with all the households and all their tax information etc i wouldn't want a hundred different excel sheets i would want one excel sheet with all of my clients information in there because now we can look at it now we can run reports etc oh this is the point that i was gonna say the the biggest thing that i think advisors miss consistently on oh. surge meetings the benefit of surge meetings is not only the massive value we're bringing to clients we're bringing clients in we're going through a lot but a lot of those times while I'm in a client, I am doing the next value add. I'm prepping for the next meeting that we're going to have. So easy example of this one is in March, I did because we we're looking at the client's taxes, we're going through things. I already did most of the math anyways on the Roth conversion. Well, I was just teeing that up for success. I knew in the fall I was going to do a big Roth conversion push. So while I was meeting with the client and I was looking at their income and I was looking at projections for this year, I just jotted down how much of a Roth conversion we should do. Well, guess what? It makes fall really easy then because I've already done that work now. Now I'm piggybacking. I'm just checking my math. Has anything changed in the last six months since we've talked that would make this number not valid? If not, I'm going to trust my former self and say, fantastic, here's the Roth conversion we should do. So it's not like all of a sudden I got to rerun tax projections for every single client because I've done my prep work in advance. And that's the same thing with value adds is we're always looking at this next year and saying, great, what value adds are we going to do? As we're prepping for surge, as we're asking clients for documents, what should we have? Easy example is, let's say you're going to do a net worth value add, solid value add, right, uh, to, to send out to clients. Clients friggin' love this thing. It's a great way to find other uh, other assets. We have uh, gamified ours, so to speak, so it looks like a scoreboard. Man, and clients want to see that number bigger, right? It, it's naturally that scoreboard. We want to increase it, which is fantastic. So it's a one pager that we send out to clients. Now, when we know we're going to do that, in advance of that value add coming into surge, we're like, hey, we need updated values on your homes. We need updated mortgage statements. We need updated loan balances, et cetera. So our team was asking for that in advance, even though it was a Q3 value add in Q1, we were asking for this information. Why? Because why wait until the third quarter to try to stuff all this work in when we're doing it already now? We're already touching it. We're already working with the client. Let's make it even easier. I love that. We also need to um, 
not be hesitant to reuse value adds. Sometimes we can fall into this trap yeah. of every year I need to come up with this bizarre, insane new value add. No, about every other year they can be reused. Every third year at, at the longest. And then, of course, Michael, we're doing guardrails in every single meeting, which is our core value yep. add. And then we're sending it out to clients once a year as well. And so a 1099 letter we're using every single year. Roth planning we're using every single year. Yep. And so, uh, again, we fall into this temptation of advisors of saying, hey, I have to create something that's worthy of being in the Journal of Financial Planning, um, which means it was never actually used with a client. But anyway, we have to create this, uh, this crazy elaborate thing. <laughs> the reality is it just needs to be really simple. The client needs to get this and be clear to them, hey, what action do I need to take or or not take equally important, and, and it's just spelled out for them. That, that is really it, right? And that's one of the things on value adds is value adds need to be able to be unique to the client and not unique as you have to create a custom value add for everything, right? But a 1099 letter, I wouldn't say, hey, great, get all your tax documents together and bring them to your preparer. That's that's actually not helpful. While it's accurate, that's what you should do. That's not helpful, right? Okay, here's seven accounts you have, and four of the seven are sending you tax forms. There are 1099R. Make sure you bring these. The other three, there's no tax reporting form for them. You're good to go. That's valuable, right? Now they can have that information. Now they know what to be looking for and what information they should get when they're sending things out. So that's the information that you need. So you need it to be unique to the client in the way that it's customizable for them. Long-term care, super easy. We just pull what state they're in and you have a whole list of, uh, of all of the states. You can just do it on the Excel, right? Big mail merge. You know, have a whole list of all the states, the different locales, the cost of care in that area. And you could simply by state start collating that information and sending out to clients being like, hey, look, here's your long term care policy at 200 bucks a day. Your cost of care average is 350. That means we got to spend an extra 150 a day. That's this much money for years. The average nursing home stays two and a half years. We need to put aside this much money to pay for the balance of that. That's just, you can mail merge that stuff, right? It's yeah. pretty quick math to put together. That's a lot of work, right? I'm simplifying it. There's a lot of work and process that goes into this, but then that's massive value to clients because now they can look at it and say, well, I got a million dollar, I got a million dollars in my assets, but I got to carve out $180,000 of that for long-term care for one of us. If two of us need it, that's 360. All of a sudden that million dollars got a lot smaller. Now we can have some impactful conversations. Boy, there's uh, so many things to draw out of this. I, I want to highlight that this long-term care piece, which I've seen and, and you and I worked on together as well, was only just one or two pages long. Um, but it did not have, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Mike, it did not have a Monte Carlo analysis. It was not 37 pages. You're it did saying, not have some. Yeah. <laughs> you, you would send it out if it wasn't 37 pages? How do you, how do you, how does a postal service do you, afford yeah, yeah. anything if you don't send it out with that much know. postage on it? Me, I'm just being sarcastic. Amazon. <laughs> exploiting, exploiting the Postal Service. Um, but, but when we're doing this, we're trying to make it as simple as we possibly can. This is a key of a value. And we're not saying, hey, let's adjust for time value of money because you probably won't need long-term care until age 87. But if it's age 89, then we need to do our inflation adjustment differently. We're not doing that. Mike, you said, hey, the cost of care today is X and you need to be able to bridge the gap of Y. We times that by two years. It comes up with this number. That's the number we need to be discussing. That's it. Is there more that you're thinking of? Yes, there is. There's a lot yes. more. There's, there's decades of experience going into behind that. But if I go past those basic numbers, I guarantee I'm going to lose the client, which is no disrespect. It's just not their expertise. And then no action will happen. And at the end of the day, Mike, I think that's the ultimate definition of success and a value add. Is the client telling you, hey, Jarvis, hey, Mike, I really appreciated this. And it made it clear to me that X. I need to take action. I don't need to take action. That is how we measure the success of a value add, not yeah. how precise is the number out to the hundredth decimal point. Sorry, yeah, I'm ranting that, there. I'm just real passionate about this one. No, it, it's super, super important, right? Let's take the buckets report, which is by far the best report you could ever use with a client. <laughs> and that, <laughs> and, but really what that does is that tells us some really important things inside of the buckets report where how much income can they safely pull out over their entire life? And that's always looking at it in today's dollars. That's not forecasting it for the next 40 years. Why? When a client asks me that, says, well, Mike, I'm, I'm 55, I'm retiring. You got this pretty little one pager right here. Actually, I never get this question. Uh, but it says, okay, well, what about the next 30 years? This actually came up at the last live conference where an advisor pulled me out on the side. That's what he was, he was really worried about. I was like, okay, number one, almost no client is going to ask you that question. Just because a client's not asking that question, by the way, doesn't mean we shouldn't have an answer for it because we should be for doing sure. a lot of back end work. But just to be clear, clients really don't ask, ask that. But if they did, Jarvis, what's inflation going to be next year? No idea. What about the year after that? 
I have less of an idea. Probably get somewhere to an idea. trend line. Yeah, yeah well, we have no idea, right? What's no the idea. stock market going to do? No what idea. are interest rates going to do, right? I mean, yeah, what are tax, tax rates, rates going to do yeah. after three years? The right? We could go on and on and on about this list. And that's what I tell clients. I said, look, we're going to plan on the based on what we know today. Based on what we know today, here's our plan A. Here's our backup plan. Here's B, right? This is the dynamic distribution concept. Here's the backup plan. If everything hits the fan and your accounts go below X for more than a year, this is the steps that we're going to take. And clients absolutely love that because it gives them something in their control. If I say, hey, if inflation goes to 12%, you have to spend less money. If the stock market does X, you have to do Y, right? If tax rates go up, you can't have that dream home that you've always wanted to have in retirement time. Boy, that really just sucks. We're at the whim of all these other people and things are going on. No, I want this to be actionable and things that they can control. What can they control? Their cash flow and spending. No, we can't control the stock markets. We, we, we can't, right? But we could say, great, here's the portfolio value at a 5% dynamic distribution. This is how much money you can pull out. We got to make decisions to live inside this. Now I'm empowering my clients that they are in control of their finances. And so that's a really key thing in these value ads is you got to make them where you're empowering the clients and decisions that they can make. It could be overwhelming to say it's $500 a day for long-term care costs, right? Holy crap. How in the, how in the, are you going to afford that? Well, that's a little demoralizing. We, again, we got to find a way to empower the client with all this. This is great. Here's the decisions that you can make. Here's the controls that you have in your life and the things that you're going to do. But I guess it reminds me, we need to do a couple of episodes just on long-term care because there's several there's several components. Oh, like we yeah. haven't even talked about the cash flow component. We haven't talked about home equity. We haven't talked about you know being aware wow. of Medicaid planning just because a client is going to have misinformation on that. We haven't talked about how to keep the healthy spouse protected. I mean, there's just so many. I, we, could, we could spend hours on this. But I, but I want to tie this back around to some action items for advisors around value ads. It can be easy when you talk to advisors who have these just really stellar practices to get really freaked out about value adds to say, hey, I can't do a value add unless I can do this really super elaborate one. Nope, you can start this. This episode is going to air mid-December. This is a great time to start on the 1099 letter, right? This is a great time to say, cool, let me log into the Backstage Pass. Let me download the template of the 1099 letter. Let me get the Excel spreadsheet that I need to start filling out if I'm not using the uh, software that we've created. And then start your team down that path, right? Which the start of that path, we need to do a whole episode on this, is you need a list of every account that was open, not open currently, that was open during the course of this calendar yes. year. That's where this spreadsheet starts. Now, again, that's that's a whole other episode. But you've got to just start on value adds. You've got to say, this is the one I'm going to do next. Let's get started on it. I love that. Action item number one is do value adds. Action item number two, systematize them. You got to come up with a system for each value add. That's the really big thing. Now, you got to have to detail this out to the nth degree, but you got to have a system in place. And one of the systems at the very top that I'm going to piggyback on, of this on, maybe another action item, is your team has to do them for themselves first. And your team, that's the person that answers the phone, and it shouldn't be you as the advisor, needs to be able to explain to you what that value add is. Why? Because they're the ones that are going to get the questions, right? Clients are going to call in and talk to the receptionist about why did I get this value add? They need to be able to answer that question. Yeah, last action item, we didn't talk a whole lot about this, Micah, today, but you have to have just a rock-solid quality control process. Yes. And, and I have to confess, we recently did a value add, and I thought, you know what? I don't need to do the quality control. We've done this value add a lot of times, and there was a couple of mistakes that went out, and more than one is too many. or well, more than zero is too many. And the mistake ultimately came from I didn't sit down and quality control the outcome. To take a look, like you mentioned, read through them, see if there's any changes. I can go ahead and start taking notes for my meeting, so this isn't a waste of time. It's not I have to pick this up twice you have to quality control those to for the example of client that doesn't have an ira let's not send them a roth conversion letter or a client that had something weird go on during the year that might throw off the report there's things that you would think your team would notice and they're just not going to notice you as the advisor need to look at that and say wait a second this is still a married filing jointly calculation and sally's husband passed away at the end of last year so this year he's, she's going to have to file single or whatever the case may be so you've got to have some strong quality control in there yeah. Ooh, yeah. That's really big. All right. So this podcast is all about taking action. Make sure you go out and do this, right? Improve your practice. Be the advisor your clients need you to be. Set up value adds. That's the key system in here. Get a value add system set up that's set up for 2023. Massively successful. And Jarvis, until next time, happy planning. Happy planning. Information designed to change lives. Financial planning can make you thrive. Start today. Don't think twice.